Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> We're reconvening in open session. Uh, let's see. Okay, would you all please stand for the flag salute? And Jennifer Castillo, would you like to lead us? Okay. All right, we starting with item 8.1, uh, approve the recommended action for student discipline case number 2021-22-03. You know, Moved. David? Correct. I'll second. Okay, call for the vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Uh, next item is report out of closed session. We have nothing to report, so we'll move on to our superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to do something different. Usually, what I, would, that I, what I do is highlight the great things that we have in our school district um, that are going on, our great programs, our great staff, and our great students that many of them are in the audience today. Um, and I would like to continue to do that. But today I thought I'll stop and remind everybody that um, we are going through a very tough time in our nation, in our district, in our community. Um, and this tough time of having to um, adjust as regulations come from the state, that districts find themselves in a position that they have to implement, even if they don't want to implement it, or if they agree or not agree, or not taking a stand, they have no choice because mandates are um, implemented and any deviation from that, districts have penalties and consequences and, and, um, and sanctions. So even though that is gonna continue and it's probably not gonna stop anytime soon, um, we just went over the implementation of the mask and how to make sure that we have some kind of a balance in our community to make sure everybody feels heard and valued from our parents. Now we're seeing ourselves starting the new regulation of having to do the testing or provide a vaccine card, and we're working through that. But I wanted to just make sure that you know a little bit of what goes on at the district level and at the site level. Normally, on a normal case scenario, every position that we have has an eight to five job with duties that are full on their plates or on their, on their desks for that full week of eight to five job. Now, with all of the regulation, it's taken staff to full-time duty to implement these regulations. A lot of the, the monitoring and the tracing of all of the steps that we have to do, uh, whether it's at the county, health department or at the state health department. It's taken full-time positions to comply with these regulations. So our staff are stretched. They're trying to do both jobs. But our mission, and we continue to say, our mission is to educate our kids. Our mission is to continue to give them a safe learning environment. The definition of safe has been you know, debated in our room here um, on the podium by many of you. We respect every position that you have, and we want you all to feel heard. And every time we have an opportunity to make the implementation of the regulation just a little bit better for our parents to feel safer, we are doing everything we can to do so. We're working with contractors to change contract language on forms that we have to fill out every single day by our staff to make sure that our staff feeling heard. So we're asking that you give grace to our staff. We're asking that you treat them with respect. Um, we're asking that you remember these are the ones that are serving your kids in all of our schools as we move forward. We're also asking that we stay united as a community. This is our parents group, our staff group. 
we want to stay united in Beaumont. We've always been united. We've always looked at as a community that was envied by many surrounding districts. We still are. And so I would like to ask that we continue to be that way. Um, some of the is issues at the state level and the nation level are dividing a lot of communities. We're better than that to continue to keep, keep united. Even though we disagree on issues, there's no uh, reason why we, can, we cannot be united on the fact that we're here to have the best learning opportunity for our students in the best learning environment. So that's my message tonight and I hope that you hear me and I want you to know that I hear you too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start um, public testimony and I am going to turn this over to Mr. Hovey because I'm suffering from cough and the more I talk, the more I cough. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Hovey. Okay. Um, <clears throat> during meetings of the Board of Trustees, members of the public have an opportunity to comment on items that appear or do not appear on the agenda. <coughs> Individual speakers would be allowed three minutes. We're changing that to two and I'll, I'll get to that. Uh, minutes to address the board on each item, each agenda item or non-agenda item. The board shall limit, could you take, I'm reading that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm right in the middle there. This is an exciting story. Um, uh, the. Uh, the board shall limit the total time for public input to each item to 20 minutes, as we've been doing because of the uh, interest of the community. Uh, we're going to allow 30 minutes uh, per topic. So it'll be two minutes per person and 30 minutes for the topic. Uh, with board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. Um, and, and we have, as, uh, as we have during uh, the past months, uh, we have both in-person speakers and we have uh, people who have submitted their comments via email. In order to accommodate as many uh, input, as much input as possible, uh, we're going to alternate between those people who were present and their uh, are going to be heard in order of when they turned in uh, their slip, chronological order. And we will intersperse those with the comments that were received via email. And uh, as uh, Mrs. Kakish has asked uh, in terms of our conduct, um, and I've said before when I've had the opportunity, we do have disagreements in our community, but we've handled them by speaking out and making our point, um, but we've never been disrespectful, we've never been disruptive, uh, we've used our democratic process uh, to be heard, and I respect and appreciate that and hope that we'll continue to model that kind of behavior uh, for our students. So, okay, we have two items that unless it's a trick, um, are not related to masks or vaccines. <laughs> so um, first up, I would invite uh, Anita Rhodes. I, I probably was surprising you here, but. Uh, Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I do appreciate that you volunteered your time, whether you're paid or not. But I'm here as a concerned citizen, and I'm here to say to you, as well as to the parents in the audience, we are going to take charge of our children's education. We're going to do that now through homeschooling, school choice, and activism. Activism is what you see here in this room. We have lost faith in you as educators. We've lost faith because you have not demonstrated the courage to withstand the evil that the school unions are foisting upon you. We've lost courage, we've lost faith in you because you have not executed wisdom when you have the information about the mask mandates. You know how damaging it is to our children. 
We've lost faith in you because you have allowed your colleagues to call us terrorists, and you know that we're not. We used to venerate our educators. We loved you. We've supported you. You have betrayed us maximally, and we're angry about it, but we're not violent. We're angry, and our anger is controlled, and it's going to be um, put to the direction where we are grooming, recruiting, grooming, vetting candidates to replace you. So I would think that you may want to reinvent yourselves because I think you've lost your careers educated in our community. Thank you. After a couple of spritzes, uh, next up is Kimberly Whitaker. Hi, good afternoon, or evening, I guess. Um, board members, um, Superintendent Kakish. Um, my name is Kimberly Whitaker. I work at Three Rings Ranch. Um, I've been in this district for about eight years. Um, I just wanted to um, actually come and ask if there was, um, we talk about the student safety and well-being and their health. Um, my concern is my floor not being vacuumed for a week, um, my desks that are so dirty, um, they look like the color of the walls there after I've washed them every morning when I come in, um, my paper towels being ran out, my soap out where I have to call in the middle of the day to get it um, filled up. So I think my concern is that my kids are my number one concern and my priority and being safe, the mask and everything. I am whatever my parents want is what I do with my kids. But my concern is the cleanliness of my room at this time. So I guess what I'm asking, I know it's short, um, but can we get, I, I wouldn't mind if you want to give me those push waitress things that I used to do 30 years ago. My kids would love to do that as a job. I can give them fake money for the store. But my room is really disgusting and I really think the parents would like their children in an environment that's not only safe but also clean. So that's all I wanted to bring to attention. All right, thank you. Appreciate you bringing that forward. Okay, now we're uh, going to. Mr. Hovey, we do have over here. Yeah, we do question. have two other comments that are not related to vaccines um, or COVID measures. Okay, that, then let's um, uh, hear those two. Okay. First comment comes from Ruby Bedran. Dear Beaumont Unified School Board members, I am a parent, employee, and community member of Beaumont Unified School District. I would like the board to consider hiring more classified and certificated employees at Beaumont High School. Currently, there are 3,175 students attending BHS. There are only four campus security guards, two support staff for counseling, two support staff for assistant principals, one principal secretary payroll sub finder, two attendance clerks, one health attendance clerk, one clerk receptionist, one sped clerk, one registrar, and one librarian. Teachers have class sizes of 40 students with students who do not have desks to sit in. Counselors, freshmen fourth through 10th grade, have caseloads of almost 600 students. This is a disservice to our students and by extension, a grievance towards our existing staff. As support staff, we are unable to provide administrators, counselors, students, and parents with the necessary support on a daily basis due to, the, due to our impacted work demands and increased workload. As a result, we are not only stretched thin, but reaching a breaking point. What we are currently requesting is that you seriously consider the repercussions of having limited staff. I would be most happy to provide actual threatening situations. I know that the school board is committed to the safety of all children and employees. Hiring an adequate ratio to service our students and parents would align with the values and mission of the school district. I appreciate the time and effort the school board puts into protecting the safety of our children, parents, and employees. Thank you for your time, service, and consideration. Mr. Castillo, I just have a clarifying question on that. We have positions, but we just, we have a lot of vacancies, correct? 
because we're trying to hire. Yes, we do have we do have uh, vacant positions that we have up at the high school that are continuously being posted on EdJoin and within um, our classified units so that we could fill those positions. Um, Excuse me. We also have added positions for certificated um, from last year as well as classified positions for this year, between last year and this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next uh, speaker via email. Yes, and I also want to add that we had comments for 11.2 and 14.1 in addition to vaccines and COVID measures. This next one is from Danielle. I have heard that the restrooms have been vandalized at the high school, so that, so that is why one restroom is open during passing period and lunch. What my issue is, how do the kids get from one side of the campus to the other, wait in a line to use the restroom since only one is open, and make it to class on time? My daughter has had has had have to come home to the school twice now, has had me come to school twice now because she started her period, wasn't allowed to use the restroom by either a teacher or security guard and then bled into her pants. My daughter has no control over when she will start her period or how heavy her flow will be. There's absolutely no reason she should be denied access to use the restroom. Figure out how to keep kids from vandalizing the bathroom without making my kids suffer as well. Open up the restrooms. Thank you, Danielle Kreider. Mrs. Kakish, the administration is aware of, of these issues, is that correct? Yes, they are, but we'll make sure that they have a plan too. Okay, and then uh, Mrs. Zapata, you said we had uh, for 11.2 and 14.1. No, when we get to those agenda items, 14 point what? One. 11.2 and 14.1. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, the others, um, these all appear to be related to uh, vaccinations or masks. And um, again, we're going to take them in order uh, from when they were received until we reach 30 minutes of uh, comments and we will uh, trade off between in-person and email. So first up is Capri Capote. And th thank you for your courage to come up here and speak in front of all of these folks and just take a deep breath and give it to us. Capri said the right thing. Hello, my name is Capri Capote and I am a student council president at Brookside Elementary. I am not scared of COVID-19, I am not scared of germs, and I wish life would go back to normal for kids. I love my school, I love my friends, and I love my teachers. I want more than anything to stay in school. My mom has always taught me that I am in control of my own body. It's my body, so it's my choice no matter what. This is why I will not be getting the COVID shot. If that is my only choice, I'll be forced to homeschool. That would make me very sad because I would miss my friends and my teachers so much. Brookside is a happy place to me, and I'm wishing every day you don't take that away from me. You were all voted to be a voice for Beaumont students, just like I was voted to be a voice for Brookside students. Please think about our hearts first when making this decision. We are all counting on you to do the right thing and stand up for our freedom. Thank you. Dr. Brown. Good evening. <clears throat> BUSD should be a leader in our community regarding the safety measures necessary for protection against COVID-19. They should be proactive with their decision making and communications to parents, students, and staff. As an educator, I wear a mask in my classroom and ensure all my students wear a mask too. At the beginning of the school year, it was somewhat difficult teaching with a mask on, but I quickly adapted and my students have too. Wearing a mask is not a big deal. I can proudly say my site administration and district support me with enforcing the mask mandate and other measures to minimize the spread of COVID. Can your staff, both certificated and classified, say the same about you? I don't like to wear a mask or get tested regularly, but I do so because I don't 
I don't get to choose who gets sick and who doesn't. COVID-19 is an invisible enemy that can only be slowed by vaccines, masking, washing hands, and other cleaning measures. If we all do our part, then we can all benefit. But if you let selfishness and anti-science rhetoric drive your decision-making, then we all suffer. Clear enforcement of masks, better testing, support of vaccines, and ensure clean environments for everyone. Please do better, Mary Stevenson. Um, next, uh, Anthony Rodriguez. Uh, some of you guys might know that my son was hospitalized at the beginning of the year. Um, he had severe complications from COVID. He almost died. Um, if those of you guys that don't know the story, you're welcome to Google it. We're all over national news. Um, so I'm here to say my family understands, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about my family, I'm talking about my sister, I'm talking about my, my brother-in-law, Coach Chris Galarza. We all understand the seriousness of COVID and what it can do to a family. Um, but when I became a parent, you know, I was told to use my gut instinct. You, and by pediatricians, everyone around me told me to use my gut instinct. So we have one side of the room whose gut instinct is telling them to put a face covering on their child along with science, which they should, and I respect, they should continue doing so. We have another side of the room whose gut instinct along with their science or is telling them putting a face covering or a vaccine in their child is dangerous. However, this side of the room is being forced to do something that they feel is harmful every single day. Now, I just want everyone to think about this. I know I'm not allowed to ask questions, but I want you all to think about this. What if, if the tables were flipped? What if the, t um, the government was forcing uh, you guys, the other side of the room, to that telling your, that you were not allowed to put a face covering on your child, you were not allowed to wash your hands frequently, they were not allowed to wear any, uh, use any type of hand sanitizer? Because um, that might not be happening today, but if we continue giving the government the power we're giving them, then tomorrow they will be enforcing rules that you don't agree with, and it's going to be too late because of the power we've given them today. So what I really want to say is I think we all need to basically join together and kind of fight against the real enemy. I mean, because just because they're not coming for your child today, they will come for your child tomorrow. This next, this next comment is from Christopher Galarza. Good evening, board members. I would like to begin with thanking you again for your continued efforts in reducing the spread of this virus. With that being said, I would like to speak on vaccine mandates. I would strongly recommend that you enforce vaccinated teachers and staff to take weekly tests along with the unvaccinated teachers and staff. As many people have already stated, everyone can catch and spread the virus. The vaccine doesn't prevent an individual from contracting the virus. I would encourage this district to take a stand against forcing the vaccine on children and staff. There are several districts throughout California that have submitted a resolution informing the state of their belief in parental choice. The lack of legal authority to, ma to mandate COVID-19 vaccines, the virus is low risk to school aged children, the constitutional protection for people to deny unwanted medical treatment, scientific studies indicating that people who have recovered from COVID-19 may have more durable and long lasting immunity to COVID-19 than individuals <coughs> with vaccine induced immunity. You're not alone. Please look at Hemet Unified School District. On their website, under COVID-19 vaccine mandate information, they stated the following. Hemet Unified continues to be a strong supporter of parental rights to the fullest extent of the law. We will continue to advocate for parent choice. This, and ha this is and has been the position of the Board of Education and the district. I pray that by the, next, by the next board meeting, the Beaumont Unified School District will be on the list of local districts, Hemet Unified, Rim of the World Unified, Hesperia Unified, that have submitted a resolution to the state of California in favor of parental choice. Thank you for taking the time to read my email. Looking forward to seeing everyone at the next board meeting. Marlene Diaz. Marlene, Marlena Diaz. I have a student at Beaumont High and a first grader in private school, neither of which I will allow to be subject to unjust mask mandates nor a COVID-19 vaccination mandate. Aside from actual science, common sense and logic would let it be known cloth face coverings are bacteria collectors and do more harm than good, even if worn correctly. They're, they're in backpacks, pockets, desktops, and even shared. Kids are in close proximity all over campus, including making out and sharing vape pens. Covering their faces indoors doesn't make a difference. 
If they're going to get sick, it's not because they didn't wear a mask or didn't get the COVID jab, which by the way, if you enforce the COVID-19 vaccine mandate, you will awake a sleeping giant. The vaccine is not proven safe nor effective, particularly for the youth. Vaccination has been reported to decrease symptoms, which is the same as asymptomatic, which is why schools were shut down in the first place because children would be silent spreaders. So now all of a sudden this is okay, along with possibility of serious side effects? No, thank you. The health of myself and my children is my responsibility. No one is talking about actual health and how to strengthen the immune system. Staying away from each other, covering our faces, and getting a COVID-19 vaccination is not my direction for my children on how to be healthy. Maybe add some real health and science to our students' curriculum. Speaking of curriculum, critical race theory renamed ethnic studies isn't going to fly either. It's victimizing, divisive, and extremely un-American. There's no place for it in our children's future or, and education. I will stand against this as well. No to face coverings, no to vaccine mandates, no to adding CRT to our children's curriculum. Thank you. This public comment is from Jennifer Darr. I'm commenting tonight to encourage the trustees of BOSD to continue to demonstrate leadership when protecting our students. While positivity rates and hospitaliz hospitalizations in Riverside County have decreased, this does not mean that this pandemic is over and we can stop being vigilant about the safety of our children. Students who are four to 11 years, as my children are, cannot receive a vaccination to protect them from COVID-19. These children must be protected by following the CDPH mandates, including masking, testing, and social distancing. I encourage this board to continue to state the requirement to follow the mandates and ensure the health and well-being of our students. Uh, next uh, in person, Keith Surdam. <laughs> Sorry, my son is a little nervous. I, I don't blame him. <laughs> um, my name is Keith Surdam. I attend Mountain View Middle School and I am in the eighth grade. God trusted my parents to make the right decision when he gave me them, gave, pardon, gave me to them. I fully trust that my parents have the, my best interest at heart. They would move mountains to keep our family safe. My family has a history of heart issues and don't want, <clears throat> and I don't want any foreign body or anything foreign in my body that will contribute to any other health problems. God didn't give me to the government to make any decision. Both my parents work for the district and they shouldn't have to fear over losing their job because they refuse to get vaccine. This just adds more stress to us as children and families. So I just wanna thank you all for letting me speak. I sure hope you do the right thing and let our parents and staff have the choice. This next message is from Bob Hughes. Hello all, I wanted to bring up the history of vaccines in the US and how fighting against the COVID vaccine mandate is one of the most unpatriotic things a US citizen can do. Most, if not all, Americans today would agree that George Washington was a military genius. Yet America's independence, my apologies. Yet America's independence must be partially attributed to a strategy for which history has given the famous general little credit his controversial order to enforce mass inoculations for smallpox. In February of 1777, Washington committed to the unpopular policy of mass inoc inoculation by, by writing to inform Congress of his plan. Washington then wrote to Dr. William Shippen, ordering him to inoculate all of the new recruitments. Washington explained that necessity not only authorizes, but seems to require the need for should smallpox infect the army, we should have more to dread from it than from the sword of the enemy. Washington's policy not only contributed greatly to the American victory in the war, but also set the standard for vaccinations required by law in the US military for the next two and a half centuries. Currently, regulations require that service members be vaccinated for multiple infectious diseases, as well as family members of military personnel who live on base. Those of you who proudly wave the updated version of Betsy Ross's flag to display your patriotism every chance you get should roll up those sleeves and put your arm where George would want it. 
The American flag symbolizes sentiments such as liberty and justice along with remembering the sacrifices of those who have fought and continue to fight protecting our country. Betsy Ross did not make the flag to say to the world, we are proud, selfish Americans who think of no one other than ourselves. So stop talking about how proud you are to be an American because your, con your continued refusal to be vaccinated is about as un-American as you could get. Thank you, Bob Hughes. Uh, next, uh, Lori Janowitz. Lori? I was just wondering what data or scientific proof you have read with your own eyes to make a decision about vaccines and why the unvaccinated need to submit a test every week. Why do vaccinated people not have to test because they still carry and spread COVID? Why vaccinated? Why vaccinate if you still need to get it, carry it and pass it on? So if you're still doing that, why are we vaccinating? Why do we have to test? Why do we have to wear a mask? I think you guys need to talk to him it and get on the same page. I have a face twitch. Doctors tell me to put Botox to stop the face twitch. Well, half my face is already frozen, so why would I do that? It's poison, it's botulism. Do you think that you're gonna put a vaccine in me that is an experiment. It is poison. It is fetal cells. It is not good. And no, I will refuse to take a vaccine. I will quit instead. And you're going to have a lot of people quitting if you force this vaccine. If you want to get vaccinated, fine. But if you don't want to get vaccinated, you should allow us that choice. Thank you. Dear Board of Trustees and Superintendent Kakish, we are writing to plead with you to consider drafting a resolution in opposition to the unnecessary, unjustified, and unconstitutional vaccine mandates that the state of California plans to impose on our children as well as staff with de uh, de despicable and tyrannical force. We were hoping that our walkout on October 18th would have sparked something in you to do the right thing and draft a resolution by this meeting, but here we are. 30% of our district student population participated in the walkout with many parents who are in 100% support of our efforts. Are you willing to lose a significant portion of your students and millions of dollars in ADA funding come next school year? Will you sleep at night knowing you could have done something but choose not to because of the political and social pressures of our skewed society? Is it because you don't have school-aged children yourself so it doesn't affect you? Is it because you don't stand to lose your livelihood and job that you love so much? Why on earth are we being forced to vaccinate perfectly healthy children under the age of 18 with a current fatality rate of 0.0007%? The CDC has already announced that children will st uh, still need to wear masks even after receiving the vaccine. When will we all wake up and realize this will never end? Our children have already been vastly affected by school closures and mask mandates. Otherwise, the AAP wouldn't have declared an emergency in childhood mental health. This is all a result of, our, of cowardly adults using children as shields and security blankets for the past 19 months. When are we going to pretend that trusting the science is really trusting the government and corporations? Medical mandates and medical coer uh, coercion have no place in a free society, especially in our schools. Let's show the rest of the country that Californians aren't a bunch of pushovers and sheep, but protectors of freedom. Please, BUSD, do the right thing and stand with us to oppose medical tyranny on, the, on our children and beloved staff. Thank you. Sincerely, Brianna and TJ Burton. Amber Pretty. My name is Amber Pridey. I am the mother of four children, three of whom attend school here in Beaumont. 
Today, I'm protesting the mandate for our children to get vaccinated in order to attend in-person public school. The last three months that our children have been enrolled in school has proven that the COVID vaccine is unnecessary. There have been few cases each month within our district and records show that each person infected has recovered. I don't agree with the mandate for the COVID vaccine because it is not 100% effective and also does not have enough research to prove that it is safe for our developing children. My kids are all under the age of 12 and are still growing. More research and tests need to be done on the vaccine and its long-term effects, but I'm not willing to use my kids as an experiment. I understand that if I choose not to vaccinate my children, I'm at risk of having to homeschool or enroll them in 21st century, which is less than ideal and has not worked well for our family in the past. For the first time ever, my family is having to consider leaving the only place my kids have ever known as home. Because of the vaccine mandate, my children have the option of a mediocre education distance learning or leaving Beaumont, California. COVID is a strain of the flu and should be treated as such. The flu vaccine is optional. Therefore, the COVID vaccine should also be optional. I don't judge or degrade others for doing what they feel is best for themselves, their families, or their children. And I am requesting the choice to do what's best for mine. Thank, Thank you. you. This next comment is from Jessica Fisher. To whom it may concern, I'm writing to voice my concern over the COVID-19 vaccine mandate. Because this mandate, effect, mandate affects my children's public school education, which we love, appreciate, and understand the importance and value of, I plead with the school board to take into consideration that enforcing this mandate is not the right choice. As we all know, being fully vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine does not mean one will not contract nor spread the virus. If your goal is to ensure that we're not spreading COVID-19 while on campus, in person, at school, then mandating the vaccine but not testing, make, not testing makes absolutely no sense. The only way to be sure that a person is not infected with a virus would be through testing. Being vaccinated should be a personal choice and not a mandate. Furthermore, vaccines are not safe or a right choice for 100% of the population. The personal belief exemption brings no comfort as it can be tossed out at any time. I believe my children are safer unvaccinated from COVID-19 and I should not be forced into this decision in exchange for their education. I plead with you to not put our children at risk in order to take the government's money. Please do what is right, not what is easy. There is an army of people ready to support you if so. Thank you for your time and consideration, Jessica Fisher. Christian Erickson. Hello, um, my name is Christian Erickson. I'm a sophomore at BHS right now. I'm on water polo. I mean, well, yeah, but um, <laughs> anyway, I start off about last year. You guys forced me to go online for a whole school year and it really messed everything up. I felt a total of nine classes, like between both semesters. And that's gonna mess up or is messing up my next three years at Beaumont High. And I wasn't able to play water polo this whole year. I got to play a total of like three games because of last year, because you forced me online. And now that I won't get something put into my body, I could be forced back online again and possibly not graduate through high school. As you said at the beginning of this, that you care about our teaching or that you care about our learning and how the heck am I gonna learn if online doesn't work for me? How else? why do this? I have to go somewhere else, go homeschool, go completely off this district for me to graduate high school. And I guess that's it. Thank you. Thank you. This comment is from Riley Fisher, a student. To whom it may concern, I chose to stay home from school Monday, October 18, 2021, in hopes to show the teachers' union that the COVID vaccine should not be mandated. First off, I feel the need to point out that mandatory COVID vaccinations is not an effective way to stop the spread of COVID-19 in our school district. Many individuals have gotten the vaccine, have still gotten sick from COVID. Therefore, even in everyone's freedom of choice was taken, 
even if everyone's freedom of choice was taken away and everyone was forced to get the vaccine, the virus could still be easily spread. There are, however, more effective ways that, that the spread of COVID might be stopped within our school district. One idea that came to mind was mandatory testing rather than vaccinations. This is obviously a much more effective choice because as you know, individuals can get infected and be asymptomatic. My point being, if an individual were to get infected but be asymptomatic, they would be informed because of the test and would be quarantined in order to isolate the virus, stopping it from being spread from that individual. If you simply just mandate a vaccine that is not completely likely to work, the chances of stopping the spread of COVID in our district is extremely, is extremely low. Another thing that I am compelled to point out to you is that the vaccine is not safe for everyone. It is uh, to my understanding that the school district wants everyone to be safe, healthy, and happy, but I assure you that mandating this vaccine will not do this. In-person school is very important to me and many other students who do not learn well in an online environment. Last year during online learning, I'm sure you know so many students' education, physical health, and mental health suffered. Finally, <clears throat> We are back in person where we are no longer affected by the afflictions that come from online schooling. Do you want to take that away from the people who are not safe to get the vaccine or other students like myself who will not be getting vaccinated? I feel passionately. Thank you. And uh, in person, Nicholas Barbie. Good evening, board members. If you care about the virus, why don't you care about the bathrooms which have pee on the walls and most of the time, one is only open? And at that, you have to wait in line for 15 to 30 minutes just to go to the bathroom. We also are about one inch apart from each other during passing period. And then we go inside and put our mask on. Districts say they, uh, Districts say they can fight the government, but here's a list of a few people that are doing exactly that. Marietta, Temecula, Hemet, Orange County, Apple Valley, and many more. I, you also see all these kids here that are gonna leave if you do the vaccine. Please fight for our rights. This comment is from Max Fisher. To whom it may concern, I chose to stay home today, Monday, October 18th, 2021, because I want to show you that it is not okay to force the COVID-19 vaccine. People should choose if it is right for them. Thank you for your time, Max Fisher, student. Diane Hudson. Hello. I've been in this area 40 years, raised my kids here. I've been, always been active in uh, community services. I coached softball for my daughter's team. I was involved with the church of Bethlehem Marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. And I really cared. I didn't know how much I really cared until I came tonight and saw the parents and the kids, and then it got real. Okay, and because I just live right here in Surrey Valley. And I'm going to tell you a major red flag to this whole um, mandate vaccine and mask thing. And that is, can you imagine they're not recognizing natural immunity? Okay. See, I had COVID and I got a test to see if I had it. And the test showed that I have immunity. It doesn't mean 100%, but I have some immunity. So why is our Attorney General of the state of California not recognizing natural immunity. Something's wrong. Okay, that is not normal. That's not right. Okay, so anyway, so I would say, um, first of all, it's not a vaccine, it's a shot. It doesn't even fit the qualifications of a vaccine. That's something wrong about that. And this school district this building, 
the schools belong to the kids and our parents. It is ours. It's, you know, it's our school and our parents and, and I mean, our kids. And I'll tell you, um, masks are cruel to children. And I'll tell you something that's cruel or shots that aren't safe and haven't really been pro proven to be safe are crueler. And they're not the answer. This mandate isn't the answer. One, one person said here that there's other ways to do it. You know, testing, testing for fever, what have you. You know, why not if they refuse? Okay. Thank you. Let them still stay. <laughs> This comment is from uh, Reese Fisher, a student, to whom it may concern. I think vaccine should be a choice. This vaccine is not safe for everyone. From Reese Fisher. Last one. This will be the last one. Email. Huh? In terms of the time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's almost 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, Lloyd White. Good evening. I want to start by saying I'm not here as a Beaumont City Councilman. I'm here as a parent of a junior at Beaumont High School. Um, it's been exactly, almost exactly 14 years ago since I came to my first school board meeting. It was the day my uh, daughter started kindergarten. She's now a, a sophomore at the University of Redland. My son is a sophomore or junior at the Beaumont High School. It was a, <clears throat> it was a lot more intimate in the uh, schoolhouse in the old <laughs> courthouse there and you know that for six years I attended almost every school board meeting and my goal was to get parents motivated and to get them to turn out and do what they're doing tonight um, it's amazing what 14 years a new president and a new governor will do to get parents excited <laughs> um, <clears throat> I know most of you and I think I know what kind of people you are because I watched and I learned in the six years in the board meetings and I've also learned a lot over the last eight years while I've been on the city council. I know you guys have our kids at best at heart, and I know that the parents are angry. They're upset. They're really not angry and upset at you. They may say they are, but what they're really upset with is Sacramento. They're upset with the governor. They're upset with the CDPH, if I get that right. But I know that you guys will do or you want to do what you think is best for our kids. And I also know that if you, there's often times, and I've had to encounter this as well, where you have to make a stand against the state, even though you know you're going to lose, even though you know that it may not get anything done, but you stand up and do the right thing. I can tell you these people here will support you, they will defend you, and they'll stand up for you if you take the, the right move and stand up for us. Yeah. If the, at the end, <laughs> in the end, you need to know you've done the right thing. My son will not get the vaccine, but he's told me that if he's going to miss his senior year like my, sis my daughter did, he wants the vaccine. Hopefully, I don't have to have that argument. Thank you. Francini. Francini. Okay, that, that concludes 30 minutes of public uh, input on that item. Should we take a recess? Um, we, Do we have any more? The, the other uh, two we have are related to specific agenda items, is that correct? Okay, then at this point, uh, we're going to take uh, an eight minute uh, recess and reconvene at 7.05. Thank you.
and those two over there. Okay, the board is back in session um, at uh, 10 after, 8 after. Okay, so I was only three minutes off. So we're now at agenda item 11.1, .1, consideration of the consent uh, agenda. Does any member have any item they wish to pull for separate uh, consideration? Okay. 11.2 um, has a comment. Oh, yeah. Okay, that it might be. Um, at, I wish to pull uh, item 11.2. And I would like to hear what the uh, public testimony is on that item after we deal with the rest of uh, the consent agenda. Any other items in consent uh, to be pulled? If not, I would request a motion to approve all the items other than 11.2. I'll so moved. Second. Okay. Any votes? And the motion passes unanimously. So item 11.2, uh, what is the public input? The comment comes from Sonia Colchado. Hello, board members. I hope you are well. I've reviewed the meeting minutes from October 12, 2021, and I noticed that there's been a public comment that has been edited. I believe this is a violation of the First Amendment rights to freedom of speech. The public comment in question is the one pertaining to Anthony Tony Bauer. According to Beaumont USD board bylaws, the minutes shall reflect the names of those individuals who comment during the meeting's public comment period as well as the topics they address. It appears that the names of two individuals remo were removed from Mr. Bauer's original statement. I've been named several times during public comment as well, and yet my name has never been removed from public comment record, nor have I felt like I've had to go above and beyond to withhold anyone's freedom to speak. It appears there are people who are brave enough to hash out fa false accusations from behind a keyboard, but can't withstand the same heat. Are public citizens now allowed to edit your public comments? If this is the case, then perhaps we all deserve a vote to review and approve meeting minutes as well. Board members, I'm asking you to hold your public records to the highest integrity and that you review and request the accurate documentation of public comments for the Beaumont USD meeting minutes pertaining to October 12, 2021 before approval. Thank you, Sonia Colchado. Okay, thank you. I have a, a, a different recommendation to the board, uh, which is that we um, we adhere to board bylaw 9324, uh, which was referenced by um, Mrs. Colchado. Um, but the, the specific language in that bylaw says the minutes shall reflect the names of those individuals who comment during the meeting's public comment period as well as the topics they address. So. Um, for the minutes of uh, the meeting of uh, October 12th, uh, I would ask that staff go back and uh, just write the minutes in accordance with the bylaw, which means all of the specific content uh, would not be included, whether it's uh, submitted in writing or whether it's provided uh, in person. And instead, we would do what the bylaw says, we would give the individual's name and the specific topic to which they spoke. And that would be consistent with our bylaw and it would remove any chance that we might intentionally or otherwise uh, not accurately reflect the comments that we've received. Unless there's any uh, other thoughts from the board, that would be my recommendation. I concur, that is our approved policy and until that, if there's ever a change in the future, we need to stick with our policies. That's correct, so that we take no action on them. Do we have to make a motion on that? To take no action? We don't need a motion to take no action. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's only that makes it. Yeah. Okay. Just the uh, comment. We just don't approve them. Sorry. Okay. I was, yeah, you, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't approve them, you wouldn't take action. Okay. Until they come back for record. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Kakish, all our, uh, these proceedings are recorded, correct? Yes. And anyone has access to those after they are yes, put on a website? website. Mm -hmm. 
And have those ever been edited? No. So well, it's a verbatim. I will defer if it's if it's ever been edited, Evan, Dr. Brown. Yeah, they're um, they're only edited if there's um, like for instance, if we took a recess and the mics were left on, we cut that out. That's the only edits that we've ever had. They're all verbatim. Thank you. So the public has access to hear exactly what is said by everybody that comes up to the podium and all of us. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So moving on to uh, the, um, yes, we had, uh, Mrs. Castillo, we had a, an appointment, is that correct? A what? Did we have a an recognition for the consent agenda? Yeah. I didn't mean to catch you in mid-text. <laughs> I'm sorry? I didn't mean to catch you in mid-text. Oh. <laughs> it's usually a fellow driver that I see doing that. Too. Yes, and as I just stated, everything's recorded at all times. <laughs> all right. President Lara, members of the board, Superintendent Kakish, cabinet, and guests. We are happy to announce the appointment of Mr. Steve Koch to the position of elementary assistant principal at Anahas Elementary School. Mr. Koch has been on the Beaumont Unified School District team since 2004. He has held the positions of counselor and middle school assistant principal. Prior to joining Beaumont Unified School District, he was a middle school counselor and a high school social studies teacher in, in the San Diego area. Mr. Koch earned his Bachelor of Arts degree at Calvin College and his Master's degree at San Diego State University. Please join us in welcoming Ms. Mr. Steve Koch to his new position of Elementary Assistant Principal at Anahas Elementary School. All right, thank you, President Lara, school board. Wait a minute, I'm running the meeting here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Yeah, you can have Acting it President Hubby. <laughs> what do you want to go? Where do you want to go? <laughs> um, yeah, cabinet. Nudity? <laughs> Who's left? Um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. I've been in Beaumont for 18 years. I love this district. I love working here. Worked with a lot of you and some of you, many of your kids. Um, so, but I'm just excited to be serving in a new role. Um, and even though it's kind of a difficult time for everybody. Um, I'm excited to jump into this role as assistant principal at Anna Haas, uh, work with Dr. Sines, uh, the staff, the students, the, te uh, the community and parents at Anna Haas. It's a great place already. I just hope I can contribute and be a part of that family and help them continue to grow. So thank you again for this opportunity. And congratulations and thank you for your uh, stepping up at a time when we do have, uh, we do need leaders to step up. So I wish you success at Anna Haas. All right. Thank you. Now, Madam President, can we move on to the calendar? Go right ahead. Now you can go. <laughs> yeah, you didn't finish your sentence. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, special people now. Are we at the calendar? Yes. So good evening, President Lara and Vice President Hubby and the rest of the board. I'm going to highlight again that we are so excited the next two weekends, full weekends, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the next Friday, Saturday, Sunday in, um, in November will be presentation of Annie at the high school theater. So um, we're hoping that you get the opportunity to attend one of the uh, showings. Okay, um, Mrs. Kakisha, yes. just, uh, um, yes. you know, I put those on my calendar when that first came out, Friday, uh, November 5th at 7 o'clock and Saturday uh, at 2 o'clock. I also put uh, on the 13th, Saturday the 13th at 2 o'clock, um, but this calendar shows it at 7 o'clock. Could we double check that? It's at 7? 
I, okay. I asked Robin to double check because it sounded like it was too late on a Saturday, but I think they're trying to give opportunity for people different. at different times. Okay, that, that's great. Just wanted to make sure we were, had it correct. We can check again, Robin, just to make sure. And I want to uh, bring to everybody's attention the week of the 15th is elementary parent teachers conferences. The next board meeting is on November 9th. There is only one board meeting in November, and we will be observing Veterans Day on the 11th. And the week of the 22nd will be um, a non-student work week and to observe Thanksgiving. So I can't believe that we are actually entering the holiday season. So it seems like this, this year went by so fast. And that's it for the calendar. Thank you. Okay, we have a presentation. Um, Bishop? Good evening, President Laura, Vice President Javid, members of the board, <laughs> Superintendent Kakish, <laughs> cabinet colleagues. We'd like to invite up Brent Bishop, the director of Highland Academy Charter School, to give us an update on how the school is doing this year. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am not here to talk about the vaccine mandate, so uh, take a deep breath. <laughs> um, well, I've, I've never been a board member. I can definitely relate to uh, Superintendent Kakish and the, and the position that she's in with regard to that, so um, I, I feel you. Thank you. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> Um, so I have, uh, I've brought with me Mr. Billy McIntosh, who is our assistant director. I hope you don't mind if he'll uh, take a few moments and uh, assist me uh, this evening. Um, so uh, we just wanted to give you an update on uh, how things are going at Highland Academy, and we appreciate you welcoming us uh, to be able to do so. Um, so I will turn a few moments over to uh, Mr. McIntosh to handle the first few slides, and then I will wrap up. Perfect. Good evening, uh, members of the uh, board, members of cabinet. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you what we're uh, doing at Highland Academy. Um, I probably am not going to receive a standing ovation like some people during a public comment, but I'm equally as excited to share with you what we're doing at our school. Um, make no mistake about it, COVID is very real for us. We have a lot of challenges, as, just as any school or district does at this time. Um, however, we're incredibly, incredibly proud of the resiliency our uh, school community has shown during this very difficult time. Uh, I should probably learn how to use this, huh? There we go. Um, so as far, actually, I think I went four to one. No, I didn't. There we go. So as far as our current enrollment, what it looks like right now, um, we currently have the most diverse group of students we've ever had um, at Highland Academy. We're really proud of that. We're proud of the program that we're offering. Um, and we're proud that considering all the diversity that we see um, currently at our school, that we're able to help every single student continue to find their genius. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a lot of teachers, we have incredible, we've given them incredible flexibility, um, and we're really able to meet the challenges of today um, in this COVID world that we're seeing. Um, so again, our current um, enrollment, you can see right there, um, despite COVID, and uh, we have a lot of people moving out of, of our school, out of the state for that matter, um, we've been able to keep our enrollment relatively full at this time. So we're very proud of that. Um, and this is referring to what I was talking about um, earlier. Um, so you can tell um, the attendance or the ADA for 2021 and 2122, the current school year. Um, so the percentages are just great. The numbers there, um, you can tell they're a little bit lower than the previous years. Um, quite frankly, we've had a lot of families just move out of state, um, move out of the area. Um, we're working to fill those spots right now. So we're making do with the students that we have, as you can tell, close to 97% attendance. I'm very proud of that. There's a lot of hard work that goes into that number. Um, and we're working to um, fill in the, the openings that we have, um, primarily in middle school. Um, one of the biggest concerns we had as a staff, as an administration coming into the school year is potential learning loss um, that we were, that we, potentially could see from our students. Um, our students were at home close to uh, 18 months on a screen, um, some of them unsupervised. It was not the ideal environment for learning, clearly. Um, so when we went back to in-person learning, our biggest concern was where are these kids? Um, what do they know? How can we help them? How can we support them? 
Um, so right now at this time, monitoring um, student progress really is a priority for us. Um, figuring, figuring out where these kids are and where we need to get them. Um, the group in yellow right there, the, the largest group, we consider those our bubble students. Um, we have a lot of students who have lost a little bit of learning but are just there. Um, so so uh, long story short, the learning loss was not as significant, um, I guess, as we feared. Um, it's there, um, and there's definitely some challenges that we have to overcome. Um, but we're very proud of where our students are, um, and we're, we're making a lot of progress. But again, that tracking and that monitoring really is key <coughs> for us in this time of COVID, just to get these students, um, figure, figure out where they are and where they need to go. So with that, I will give it to Mr. Bishop. All right, um, so our director of finance was not able to join us tonight, so he asked me to read something uh, just in regard to our finances. So if you'll uh, bear with me for a moment. So um, every year while we prepare our budget, we always use a multi-year financial uh, comparison, as I know that the district does as well. Uh, that way we can ensure that we're meeting our, uh, our operating budget uh, and, um, and our objectives and make sure that we are financially viable. So what you have in front of you, uh, this slide and the next two, are basically a uh, financial report on the last three years. Um, so uh, with our enrollment being capped at 340 students based on facilities and based on our agreement with the district, uh, we have to be pretty careful with our expenditures and make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. So uh, we have multiple measures in place to make sure that that happens. Uh, you can see there that, um, that, we're, uh, that we're looking solid as far as those projections go. Um, any major contracts, uh, any major vendor uh, agreements, all of those go through our board to make sure that we have plenty of oversight and that we're doing things appropriately uh, and being as efficient as possible. Um, <clears throat> so you can see all of our expenditures there. Um, as, far as, uh, as far as some of those things, you'll notice a little bit of fluctuation. Some of that's due to COVID and some of that is due to uh, adjustments in our program. But um, at the end of the day, the bottom line there, you can see that we've got a good, healthy um, ending balance uh, and cash reserve, uh, which given the circumstances right now of COVID and, and uh, our enrollment being down a little bit, we're, uh, we're pretty grateful to have that there just as a, uh, as a cushion. Um, so we do want to congratulate the district on uh, opening Summer Wind. Uh, we're he we hear good things, um, but uh, our enrollment's down a little bit because of that. So we're, we're doing our best to fill those spots. Nothing personal, it's just business, right? <laughs> so um, anyways, we're, uh, we're continuing to fill those spots. Um, as, as you know, your, uh, your district staff does a great job in reviewing all of our information and they're gonna see those numbers coming up over the next month or two. Uh, our enrollment has increased significantly in the last 30 days, so you'll see those numbers come up and um, just wanted to give you a heads up there. So um, anyways, any, any questions there I'm happy to uh, respond to, otherwise I will uh, keep going here. <laughs> So um, again, as of, uh, as of, and that should actually say October, I apologize for that, but um, as of the end of October, which we're uh, just about to experience, we're at 325 students, so we're down a little bit, uh, but again, our attendance is up. Um, you can see our revenue there. Uh, you can also see our surplus, which is uh, a review from the last slide. Um, so again, from a, from a fiscal perspective, we're looking very solid. Um, we're trying to be as conservative as possible and make sure that that money stretches so that we can get through this time and um, make sure that we're continuing to be viable. Um, <clears throat> so just a couple of updates. Um, we did uh, recently join the El Dorado SELPA, um, which oversees uh, charter school operations uh, throughout the state uh, with regard to special education. Uh, so that's brand new for us this year and that's going well. Um, our staff is, uh, is managing that really well and uh, we're receiving uh, a good level of support from the El Dorado SELPA. So um, while we miss the Beaumont staff that used to work with us uh, when, when we were under, uh, under your oversight, uh, we are uh, managing that successfully and we're, we're pleased to report that. Um, current staff um, are incredible people. Um, we've got 33 full-time staff members and a few part-timers as well. Everybody's fully credentialed. There's no vacancies. There's no misassignments. So everything looks good as far as that goes. Um, our staff retention rate over the last couple of years is at 94%, which we're really, really pleased about. Um, I know there's not a lot of charters out there that can say that, so we're, uh, we're definitely proud of that. Um, as far as COVID compliance is going, I promise I won't say the word. <laughs> you are wearing a yellow uh, shirt, however. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're doing our best to manage that, as I know you are uh, as well. Um, 
just know that uh, you know that we're following all state and federal mandates with regard to uh, student health and uh, and COVID safety, and we'll continue to do our best with that. Um, we have received some grant money, as I know the district has also, uh, supplementing access to technology and uh, PPE and different things like that. So um, all that is going as well as could be expected, and uh, we'll continue to monitor that. Um, we do want to give a big shout out to. Uh, Mike and James over here with regard to facilities. They have taken amazing care of us and we really appreciate that. Um, coming back from COVID, um, the air conditioning units were the biggest challenge, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so there was a lot of work required there and um, they, they did an amazing job. So we really appreciate the support we're receiving from them and uh, the help that they're giving us. Um, but everything looks in good shape. Uh, AC units are all up and running. The buildings are in good condition. and. Uh, um, from a uh, sanitation standpoint, um, we feel like we're doing a pretty good job and um, keeping the facilities clean. So um, with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to respond to them. But uh, that's kind of us in a nutshell. So. Well, I think you answered uh, my question. I was just, you know, as you know, in the district, all districts were having some challenges uh, filling positions. Um, and uh, congratulations on being fully staffed. Uh, Thank you. I, I will say that subs are a challenge. That's, that's where we're finding the most difficulty to, to fill, but uh, we're hanging in there. That's good. And uh, you know, we didn't open a, a summer wind uh, you know, with the intention of uh, diminishing your attendance. Duly noted. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it's good that we have a viable uh, quality options for uh, the students in our in our district. So thank Appreciate you, Mr. You Bishop. So. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, for Mission Vista Academy, uh, Amy Davis. Good evening, and we would like to invite up Amy Davis. She is the principal of Mission Vista Academy, and they're here to present an update for you tonight as well. Hello. Hello. It's good to see everybody again. I also have Erica Vanderspeck. She's the assistant senior director for Mission Vista Academy. So we were going to kind of present together since it's been a while. We have a lot of good updates for you guys. All right, so this is actually a picture from pre-COVID. Pre so <laughs> that's lots of our teachers, but we've actually probably gained a few teachers since then. Um, this year, we're at about 4,300 students. We have maybe just a little bit under that because we have kids in the enrollment process right now. And we're servicing TK through 11th this year. Uh, we are a non-classroom-based independent study. So it's all individualized learning for our students. Um, we're serving Riverside County, San Bernardino, San Diego, and Orange County, mostly Riverside County though. And you can see our demographics up there. And this year we currently have 272 employees and 139 of those are general ed teachers and 38 are sped teachers. Okay, so here's our history for you guys. Since it's been a couple of years, we've been through a lot, um, but we're really proud to report, you know, what we went through and where we are today. So um, in Mission Vista was a network of, or Inspire was a network of schools when we first came to you guys. And so um, it was founded by Nick Nichols and there was one school board, but multiple schools in the network. So um, then Inspire, <laughs> they kind of had a lot of different names, but they became Provenance, which was also known as the Inspire District Office. and they were a service provider to us. And that was also founded by um, Dr. Nichols in July, 2018. So you guys all approved us in March of 2019. And we had our own governing board and we opened our doors for kids on July 1st, 2019. So also in Ju July, 2019, Inspire Charter Schools, the entity dissolved, so we, were very um, reliant on the Inspire model because they were providing us all of these services. So um, soon after that, in September of 2019, um, Dr. Nick, Nick Nichols, he was placed on a leave and then he resigned. So that was uh, big for us. So we worked 
really, really hard um, every single day um, to be independent. So we, it, there's just so much in running a charter school, but we work really hard to become independent. So we started our own wind down plan. And in 2021, we limited our services. It was down to just very little that we needed from provenance. And this current school year, we are um, functioning totally independent. So we don't have a service agreement with Inspire anymore or with Provenance. Um, and we actually don't even have a relationship with them. So <laughs> that's the really exciting part that we wanted to report to you guys. <laughs> So we wanted to share with you, um, we have sort of collectively collaborated with a couple of the former Inspire schools um, who we have a history of shared collaboration with um, and similar models. All um, those other two, as well as Mission Vista, ended their relationship with Inspire um, and are independently operated, separate governing boards and separate budgets. Um, and with the vetting of legal counsel, an MOU for shared staff was approved to provide uh, some of the operational services um, that Provenance used to provide. Um, and it was a way to do some cost savings um, and just provide some efficiency as we um, have built out our, our capacity for independent operation. So. Um, We have um, our financials we wanted to present to you, um, and we're happy to report um, as of the September close, revenue has increased due to our increase of projected enrollment. Um, and there are also the additional ESSER two funds that were not originally budgeted, but um, have been earned. And so the expenses have increased mainly um, because of the staffing with the additional students and the supplies due to the increased enrollment. Here you'll see we have a healthy fund balance that exceeds the state requirements. And right now we're still projecting 23.8%, which is a good buffer for any un um, unanticipated costs. And here um, you'll see cash is positive and healthy and there's no factoring projected for this year. <laughs> And as of the September close, we are in compliance and trending positively with solid enrollment. All right, just to tell you a little bit about our WASC, we got our initial um, accreditation of three years back in March 2020. So this year, we're going to host our self-study. Um, and we already have staff working on surveying and gathering our data and getting ready for our self-study that'll be in the spring. Oh yeah, and high school. Um, so in the spring, we had 98% of our kids pass their courses. So we were really proud of that. We had um, students complete 27 honors and AP classes and 100% passed those. Um, some of our students take community courses or community college courses and we had 33 of those that passed their classes and 94 percent of our high school students are on track to graduate and if they're not they're on a plan and being monitored closely to make sure we get them back on track our counseling department is meeting with all of our 11th graders and this year we've added tons and tons of parent parent workshops and parent education to help our parents since they're the primary teachers for the kids So our next topic is AB 1505, um, which is the legislation that puts charter schools into tiers for eligibility for renewal based on the dashboard indicators. And currently we would be put into the middle tier based on our performance, um, but due to, to COVID, the dashboard has not been published in the last couple of years. Um, so per AB 1505, um, we use the student growth percentile, that SGP, to measure academic progress by looking at um, expected growth over one academic year. And so um, 
we did have our students participate in the remote cast and then we continued with our internal assessment as well, just so that we could have as much data as possible. And so with our internal assessment, we had 97% participation last year. And here you'll see um, we have uh, our SGP. So that's the, the 50, 50 percentile would be the, what we're aiming for. And so um, we're pleased just given COVID and all the challenges that our kids may have faced that anything close to 50% is um, we think worth celebrating. So you'll see our, our K2s here um, and then our grade levels here for reading and then for um, math. And you'll see a few of our grade levels met or exceeded that 50th percentile. All right, for our multilingual and our English learners, we currently have about 53 in our school. Um, 100 of them, 100 percent of them took the LPAC, and 17 of them reclassified. Um, let's see. So we have a program where our students can go to live ELD. So 70 percent of them are enrolled in our ELD classes, and we also have something called the LPAC chat, where our EL director um, meets with the families and they talk about the LPAC and they talk about different resources and things. 73% um, of them have made those meetings. And this year we established a DLAC for our school and we have approved bylaws and we added a bilingual parent liaison that helps um, with the communication. And we launched a variety of parent workshops that are good for everybody and then some are focused on EL. Um, and our STAR 360 data, which is our internal assessment, so of our EL kids, the reading was 41% blue, blue and green, and then 33% were blue and green in math. And that included our ELs and our RPEP students. All right, and then uh, we have a robust and wonderful special education program with the full gamut of services for whatever um, each student needs as stated in their IEP. And you can see we have uh, 536 active special education students, which is about 11% of our population. And there's some information on our staffing and our assessment team. So we do have um, internal psychologists and um, an SLP and a nurse. And anything that we are not able to provide through our internal staff, we would contract out to MTA. Um, and you'll see here uh, our list of some of the curriculum that our special education students use, designed for the model that we operate and, and meeting their needs. Um, and here you'll see the services are delivered um, primarily. We have virtual services since our kids are enrolled in a virtual school. Um, but again, as, as I said earlier, the, it, their services are based on what is written in their IEP. So if there is in-person services written in their IEP, that's what they get. Um, so we do have virtual classroom style SAI, small group, one-on-one, -on -one, in-person. And then we have um, virtual extra support classes for our older kids. And we are also uh, members of the El Dorado Charter Club. Um, and we also <laughs> have been going through COVID as long as you guys have, and we've, we've faced all of the same kinds of challenges and had to work through lots and lots of stuff, but we are following all the mandates. Our teachers are currently either vaccinated or conducting weekly testing, and we're following all the, the protocols for, you know, if, if we have park days or field trips, any of that, our families are following, families and teachers are following those protocols. And we both just wanted to thank you guys. Thank you for your time. And we really appreciate the partnership with Beaumont Unified. And we also um, have been working hard on the material revision. So we look forward to bringing that to you guys soon too. Um, I, are, are you guys, are, are you guys tracking for your ninth through 11th graders for how many will be A through G compliant by the time they're graduating? Yes, we are. 
Okay. And so the program that you're using is A through G approved for them? Yes. Under your, your, under your, um, your um, charter or is it under another charter or the program that you use? So we have course outlines uh -huh. and those go to UCLP and have been approved. So if you're using Edgenuity or you're doing um, textbook work that's been put together, then that you're following the outline which has been approved. Oh. So I appreciated that uh, detailed history of uh, who's on first. Uh, and um, I know there was some question or concern about enrollment numbers um, and that to your knowledge, all of that is resolved and copacetic, is that correct? Yeah. And, uh, and so you are in compliance with uh, your, um, your charter documents? Well, we're, we are doing the material revision and we're updating enrollment numbers um, with the district and your legal counsel. So we will be bringing you the most current um, to be compliant. Okay. I think I thought it was kind of a yes, no question, and the answer was sort of neither. Um, um, so I'll change, I'll ask a different question. Um, how many of your 4,300 students are students who would reside within the boundaries of Beaumont Unified School District? Ballpark, I would no names. 90 kids, 90 to 90, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right, thank you for the update. Thank you. <coughs> okay, and um, this next item pertains to the uh, ESSER 3 expenditure plan. And, and um, there is a public comment on this. Yes, thank you for that reminder. I'm getting it from everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I took this on free. Um, you know, I, anyway, so go ahead and cough just to prove why I'm doing this and not you. Um, so uh, we will take the uh, public uh, uh, comment uh, and then uh, the board's uh, consideration. Four? Oh, four public. Okay, all right. Are they all saying the same thing? Okay, well, go ahead. Uh, they get two minutes. Each. Hello, board members. <clears throat> I hope you are well. I'm writing you tonight to please consider a revision of the ESSER 3 expenditure plan before you vote to approve it today. I've asked the Board of Trustees, as well as Ms. Kakish, to please include rapid testing and flu clinics in their ESSER 3 plan. Rapid tests are instrumental in helping mitigate the spread of COVID. They are the quickest way to catch the virus, particularly if the student or staff has symptoms and or has been identified as a close contact. Thank you for offering PCR tests for our students, but consider that the system to register is a little complicated, particularly for those families that are mono monolingual Spanish speakers and those that might not have online access or are tech savvy. Rapid tests are easy to use, particularly for those who might be deterred from the logistics of PCR tests. We should have them at each school site, just like many other districts in our county. As we ease into winter, we will also begin to see uh, uh, more children and families having to deal with the flu. It would be great to offer flu clinics at our school sites for those families that might be struggling or hesitating, hesitating to get a flu shot for themselves and their children. Additionally, a requirement for the creation of the ESSER 3 plan is to have community feedback. I've wondered how the district has received community feedback from the monolingual Spanish-speaking families. Yes, the original survey was offered in Spanish, but, it is current, but is the current plan available in Spanish? Be, being, that we do not have, being that we do have a dual immersion school in our district, I would, like, I would think it's vital to have community feedback from those families as well. Beaumont USD should be offering our community resources that will help families become healthier and, and encourage them to test and vaccinate. We also asked Dr. Brown if our school site council could provide feedback on the ESSER 3 plan since other districts have done this. 
and we were denied the opportunity. Uh, did you tell us uh, the author of that? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, that is Sonia Colchado. Okay, for the record, that's all. Next comment is from Henry Colchado. Hello, board members. I'm writing regarding implementation of COVID-19 testing at schools, primarily rapid testing. I understand PCR testing is now available at some BUSD schools, but using funds for rapid testing would have students return to class with fewer missed school days. There are huge, huge advantages to using rapid tests in terms of speed and convenience. Detecting and slowing down the spread of the virus should be a high priority goal for all the school community. As the cold months approach, students will inevitably catch the flu, which is why I propose schools begin offering flu vaccine clinics. Having flu vaccine clinics set up will also help speed up the process once we transition into required COVID-19 vaccines. I'm requesting rapid testing to be included as part of the ESSER expense plan and setting up vaccine clinics for students and family members. If other school districts are already offering this, I know Beaumont can do this as well. Thank you. Henry Colchado. Good evening to the board. I would like to inquire about the progress, if any, that has been made regarding the audits of the incomplete falsified mask waivers. Has someone been delegated to handle this? Will the board openly address this at, at the upcoming meetings? Why are kids still allowed to not wear masks in some classrooms? Even with a legitimate waiver, they are required to have a specific face covering as outlined by CDPH. Hand Handing in a legitimate waiver does not exempt you from wearing a face covering. We are almost three months into the school year and the district still isn't taking a strong stance on enforcing this. I'd like to address one component of the ESSER 3 expenditure plan, but specifically plan alignment to the 2021-22 ESSER GEAR SB117. The action description for this plan fails to include rapid testing. Why would you not explicitly state and offer rapid testing at school sites to prevent, prepare for, and respond to coronavirus. It states that it will include mobile hand washing stations, hand sanitizer stations, additional masks and, and shields, desk shields, plexiglass barriers, COVID-19 testing protocols, sanitizing wands for custodial use, and disinfecting wipes. This sounds great, but how can the, dis can the district not allocate money and see the additional value in offering rapid testing at its school sites for symptomatic students? It wasn't until only recently that PCR COVID testing would be made available at schools for students, but paid for by their personal health insurance or paid for by the district for uninsured students. You are better, better prepared if you are proactive instead of being on your heels and reactive. In comparison to other districts and their genuine intent to keep their schools open and safe to, the be to their best abilities, I can only deduct after the first three months that BUSD has been reactive, unprepared, and a, and a poor communicator. To quote Simon Sinek, leadership isn't about being in charge, it's about taking care of those in your charge, Brent. This next comment is from Georgina. Good evening. When looking over the ESSER expenditure plan, I noticed that there is still no money being de delegated to rapid COVID test. Concerned parents continue to speak up regarding this need and your constant disregard is troublesome to say the least. The current COVID tests are offered at the Beaumont schools, at the Beaumont schools are being charged to individuals, medical insurance companies. These insurance companies will be utilizing funds received through the CARES Act to, to cover the cost of these tests. If the funds become exhausted or the child or staff member does not have medical insurance, then the district will be paying $39 per test. It was stated in a previous board meeting that rapid tests would cost the district seven to $8 a piece. With the pushback you have had and continue to have regarding mask wearing and the vaccine mandate, these tests are going to be needed for months to come. When the district is not willing to spend seven to $8 on tests, but somehow is willing to spend $39 per test, it is clear that the district is hoping the insurance companies do not run out of funds. Communication between the district and, and school sites continues to be lacking. In the previous board meeting, Dr. Brown stated that COVID testing had already been implemented for students. This was a lie. No one had communicated with the school offices that tests were to be given to students. When I went to obtain one for my child the morning after the meeting, 
the office staff was confused, as was the school nurse and principal, as to basic questions regarding the pro provided COVID test. Per a clarification email from Dr. Bobby Burnett, the director of student services, the COVID tests were not supposed to be handed out to students until the following week. This would explain the confusion between Dr. Brown's false statement and lack of preparedness at the schools. The continued lack of communication is beyond frustrating for parents. I imagine that this must also be extremely frustrating for school staff members who are continuously left in the dark. Again, I ask you to include funds from the ESSER 3 plan to be delegated to rapid COVID testing and better intercommunication between the district, schools, and parents. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you. That concludes. Okay. Um, board members? Um, I don't know who wrote the ESSER 3 plan. Who did? To, to speak to? No, that was, there were four comments. Okay, I accept your apology. <laughs> um, does this plan expend all of the ESSER three funds? The reason for the question is um, you maybe at some point we'll want to be able to provide rapid testing. Uh, and I say that because of some concerns in the medical community that uh, during the, the colder weather that we may be seeing another bump uh, in uh, infections. And so we may want to add something else to our uh, quiver of solutions. So are we spending every last cent or do we have some money that's unallocated should we uh, decide there's a need to uh, make available a rapid testing at the site? There are some year two expenses um, that are allocated that if down the road, we, we decided that that was something we wanted to do. We could reallocate some of those year two expenses somewhere else and add that in if we needed to, technically. Uh, I was going to say, <clears throat> Bless you. I, I'm, I also agree that we need to be, I, I thought we were having some rapid tests, and so I agree because just me personally going through that in a school district, I just took... I, t I didn't realize that how much of a difference from the regular testing to the, the rapid test. And a rapid test, I got a result and peace of mind within 15 minutes. And on Thursday, I volunteered to take the test, the regular test in my own district to see what it would be like for people that have to test every week. And I was told that it, the results come back in two days. Um, I didn't get the results until this morning. And I took it on Thursday, and this is Tuesday. And that was a long time for me to be wondering, was I, I mean, so, and I wasn't exposed to anybody or anything, and I wanted to see what the, the results would be like. So I could totally understand, and especially <coughs> if we have students that perhaps were, that when we're doing contact tracing had spent time and need to be checked out for that, for staff members because the amount of time waiting could be infecting or perhaps endangering someone. So let me ask you, what, so why are we, there we go. Okay, so um, why are we doing PCR instead of rapid? We were advised by Riverside University Health System that um, rapid the rapid tests um, have a, a propensity to have a lot of false positives and that they would require a PCR test anyhow even after a, a rapid test. Um, so the, the, in terms of using it and what we're utilizing it for is quarantining and um, county health has told us they would not accept that. Okay, well, so do they have to accept the results for us? In, in terms of quarantining, what they've said is if you're going to quarantine, you have to follow up with a PCR test. That's th been the guidance from Riverside University Health System. Which I would agree. I think you should have a backup to make sure. But if you get a negative and the peace of mind in it and you're more apt to get a fake positive than a fake negative, you know what I'm saying? Meaning that I, I just think that we need to be thinking about that. Because especially, especially oops, with sports and everything that happened last year and whatnot, that if a student is quarantined, and you know, I, you know, and I know policies 
change and, and there are these things and that things and you know that if you had uh, you had the opportunity of a rapid test and people were negative then it would clear a, but, but just, what if you get a what if you get a false negative yeah, but if you get a false, if you get a false, you wouldn't get a false negative. They're saying that they're more apt to get a false positive. That's what he just said to us. That's what public health advises us. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, but there is a risk that. But if you got a, a positive either reading. way, you'd want to check to really make sure. Because right. But if you have a false negative, you're going to move on and, you know, think you're fine, when you possibly might not be, and just um, I know the banning took you some days. How long is it taking for ours? Um, Penny, can you answer that one? As long as the parent or the staff who's taking the test fills out the registration card and it is picked up at noon by our courier, results are being received by that evening. And if they're picked up the next day by noon, it would be the next evening. Oh, and you haven't had anything that's lasted longer, I mean, taken longer than that? It is taken longer if the registration card wasn't filled out or the email is incorrect and the registration isn't um, complete. So we've been working through some of those that might be an issue, and that might be why they're not receiving results. But um, as long as the registration goes through, they get a confirmation email, and then when the results are read, then they get the email um, results that same email. Okay. Um, and we're doing these at each school site, correct? Yeah. Every school site has um, both tests, the shallow nasal swab and the um, saliva test, mm -hmm. and that's available for students or staff and for the required weekly testing. We also have uh, kits here at the ESF, and we also have a uh, locked box out front that is open 24 hours, so if they do it at their convenience, they can drop it in the locked box, and the courier will pick it up the next day at noon. Okay. And the, the, the tests that we're providing are available to symptomatic people or people who uh, were at risk of having been exposed? Both. Or is it available to anyone who just feels like having a test? We have the weekly required that, or the those that choose to participate in the weekly um, testing for validation or verification, and then also symptomatic or those that are close contact that need to test from between the three to five days after. Those are eligible for them as well, staff and students. So somebody who doesn't fit those three categories is not eligible for the test? Well, the staff members can fill out a card and participate in the weekly testing. We still, they're welcome to test every, every week as well, Where vaccinated or unvaccinated. We are doing the weekly required for those that need to do it, but it is eligible for any employee or staff that would like to take the test. What about students? Students, the parents would come into the health office and pick up a, a kit as well, but they would register as a student in the student portal. Okay, but they don't have to be symptomatic or in close contact. I don't know that any of them have requested that, but I don't know that yeah. we're gonna screen that out if okay, they just, just wanted to test, because they have symptoms, things like that is why they're mm -hmm. requesting them. So what I'm understanding for students that are already on quarantine and so they take the test after three to five days and then they get the results. If they were given the notice that they were confirmed a close contact, mm -hmm. then that That's would be the case, yes. So you're saying that if they did the rapid test, they could find out sooner, is that what you're thinking? Well, um, th that was my initial point, but I guess with the Id idea that they're being quarantined for the three to five days to start with already, no matter what the rapid test shows them, correct? Yes, the, the guidelines for quarantining, if you are a close contact to somebody who has um, been a positive confirmation, then the recommendation is to not test. They may have symptoms, they may not have symptoms. If they have symptoms right away, then they, they can pick up a test right away. But the recommendation is to be tested three to five days after so the gonna contact, be, they're gonna confirmed be contact. they're going to either way. Yeah, so for, for example, so when just recently for me, when I got it, then my daughter got it a few days later. She took a test, it came back negative. She waited another day or two and took it again and was positive. So it, 
there's nothing you can do in, in, the, in the in between time, right? So if you've been in close contact with somebody, there's no way for you to find out whether you have it until you wait those few days. Because you don't have it until you Because you don't it. have it yet. Yeah, or you might have it, but it's not showing up yet. So that, that's what happens. And then, um, you know, and then it just kind of goes down the chain. So when she got it, then, then her husband got it a few days later than her, like a week later. So, but, um, so you have to assume you may have contracted it um, until basically five days out. And yes. if, you, if you take the test at five days and it's negative, you can presume uh, that you're not infected. Right. But if you take it before that, uh, you may be infected, and so therefore you have to take uh, quarantine or isolation precautions. Is that correct? Yeah, yes. So that's what I'm saying. So even if, even if we had the rapid test, so you've been in a close contact with someone in your classroom, may not show for a few days. That's why you have to do the quarantine for the few days and then take a test. So my son-in-law works at the hospital and by the days they said go home but come back tomorrow and get a test because you're still in the window where it's not going to show a part or a, a correct result. I can just tell you that when you do the rapid test and they tell you you're negative it just makes you go oh thank goodness. <laughs> or when you, it says you have it you just kind of go what? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have before us a uh, request to approve uh, the plan. Um, this is somewhat different from the conversation is, uh, there is a section in here where we report um, our community and parent input. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that we incorporated the input we received at the October 12th uh, board meeting as uh, some of the input. Um, is there a reason why we wouldn't include that source of input? Uh, in the uh, report, whether we agree to do what they asked for or not? We didn't, <clears throat> sorry, we didn't put in um, specific um, actions from the input, but we did put in there that it, w that it was brought to um, board on October 12th and received public input. And that the input requested um, a rapid test. Yeah, we did not include that in there. Okay. But, um, we, primarily because whatever the input was that we're taking action on is listed in the other sections that we're expending the funds for. Yeah, I, well, there are things that we got input on that we didn't choose to do, but we recorded the input. My question is why would we not do the same with the input about rapid test? Um, we, again, if the board approves the plan, we're not agreeing at this point to approve rapid test, but it, it seems like we should at least record the input that we got. I don't know what, what section refers to other input that we don't have um, well, action. We talked about uh, the, the thought exchange and, and, and all of those kinds of things, um, and the, the input that we got from that. With actual, I, I don't know that there are actual items okay. in there. <laughs> Community engagement. Page three. And on the page four and five. <coughs> so on, on page. Uh, Five of twenty-eight is recommendations from the thought exchange. Okay, so <coughs> that didn't come from the thought exchange; it came from uh, uh, public input at the board meeting. So again, these are recommendations that we're not necessarily doing everything that we were asked to do, but we recorded what the public requested. Right. I think we we were just putting in that that we did receive input on October 12th. I don't think we listed, we just didn't list those specific items out, but that we did receive public input. Okay, well, I don't know how helpful it is to say people gave us input 
period without citing what the recommendations were. Uh, again, I'm not saying that we should do it or not do it. I just think that we should include everything that there was some significant interest in us doing. So and my the yeah. input. If I can just um, add to this. So usually when we put a plan in place, so for example, LCAP, um, we have a whole process for gathering input. Sometimes the documentation of that process doesn't necessarily take place in the plan itself. So the final document that goes to the state or to the county might reference feedback and the actual feedback could be in a different document later on when the auditors check on it. So there's different ways you can um, reference feedback. So having to reference that there was some accepted on that date, we can go back and reference what specifically was, um, was recommended through other means than just referencing it in, the, in detail in the plan. We do that for the LCAP, we do that for several um, plans that, that for compliance. So it doesn't have to all be included in the plan template, if that makes sense. Well, I don't know that it addresses my concern, which is right. limited to us recording the input we received from the public on this plan. We, there are different ways we've identified it. The Google form survey, um, thought exchange, um, and uh, <coughs> some of the other items were collected by stakeholder feedback. I just don't know why we don't reference in one line um, public input requesting um, rapid testing of students and staff at the school sites. That was public input we received, we're just not acknowledging it. I think the question, did you record every public input you received for the plan in every setting? If, did, did you record everything that was, that was included? And if so, we do need to be consistent. But if you kept it in a different document. It's a summary of everything that you did. And this is your summary, not verbatim. Because if you see anything verbatim, then you would basically, what you put in is a request to become every person that asked for the request. Can, you, can, you, can you, you speak to the microphone? Yeah. To the microphone. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think that the question is, did we get that the summary? So if we responded to the thought exchange and you actually saw every question, it would be more than just the rapid testing. It would be, uh, they would have talked about what they wanted um, more staff or they wanted specifically smaller class sizes. They were very particular. Even some asked for more, less homework in the classroom that didn't really relate, for example. So was so, that, in, so was it that was a summary in, okay. of everything, that, but it wasn't verbatim. Okay. So I, I, maybe I, I, that helps because if we had if we listed everything verbatim, I I it would be very specific to okay. specific school sites, even people's names, for example. It was it was just a summary. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm looking at this, and I see under recommendations from the thought exchange community and staff, there's a list of eight. There's not names. It's not verbatim. It's not uh, every uh, pithy uni thing that somebody came up with. It's increase and centerize substitute teachers, allow for more social emotional learning, uh, uh, increase support, um, healthy breakfast, um, and allow students to use barriers and shields as needed. I, I'm not asking for a decision. I'm just asking for a record of the public input that's relevant uh, to this question. So and if it's somewhere, the will of, it makes sense. If it's the will of the board, if you'd like to approve this plan with this modification, we can we can add that reference. I would be more comfortable saying that there was request for rapid testing, but staff <coughs> recommended to the board that we stick with the recommendation from the county health, and that's how I would adjust the plan, just that so that it's not confusing to the public that there was a request and we just didn't address it. I, I think it's more of a question 
to me is like a lot of times, and, and it could be something that's different, I don't know, is that a lot of times when things were given to us like this in the past, it was like a presentation of how they came up with it. And so there would be like a summary at the end of, you know, this many people were surveyed or questioned. This kind of, you know what I'm saying? That we've had a lot of those kind of presentations where it gives you an, it gives you an idea, because you're not going to be able to put everything, but you're going to be able to put it into a category of things. You know, and, and in the category of COVID, it would be like all of the types of things that would be counted into that pie chart of where the responses came. Does that make sense? Yes. Is that what you're kind of looking for, Mr. Hovey? Well, I don't know any other way to explain. I just asked for a single item that says we received a request to provide uh, rapid testing. So it's not being addressed in the plan. So on page four, um, it says, finally, the plan was shared as an informational item at the t October 12th meeting. Um, maybe we should just add in there that, um, you know, if you add a line to this where they requested rapid testing. Right. Would that satisfy your? Uh, yes. Uh, just curious. We can certainly do that. That's a very easy adjustment to make. So we'll approve this um, with the revision requested if you want to take that. Amended motion. Do we have a motion? Yeah, oh, we have a motion do you? So not yet. Okay. So Well it does make me wonder how what are other things that people have asked for that uh, I think we had a presentation with on this October in September, 12th. correct? You gave that presentation? The, yes. October, right. October twelfth had was all on the October items. October twelfth. That's why oh, the, uh, I'm seeing a connection. Oh I thought um, so we had the presentation about what went into it, I, and I guess, um, you know, the October 12th input, uh, could, there could be, as uh, Mrs. Laura said, an, an easy insert um, on page four, page five, like after Thought Exchange, it says this, after Google Survey, it said this. I understand, though, with a lot of these, um, you can't put everything, you're going to have a document that's humongous um, you have to summarize some of this so um, I'm in favor of if we're if, and if there was something else from October 12th besides rapid mm -hmm. testing then maybe put a line in there about that I'd be in favor of that as I well. think the flu shot was another recommendation uh -huh. and we also did not think it would belong in this plan we do cover that item in different plans and different funding so we can go back and review all of the feedback and summarize it and add a statement behind the October 12th feedback. Uh, again, I'm not asking for everything that anybody asked for to be included here. There were a significant number of people interested in rapid testing. That's why that one has some resonance for me in terms of being accounted for. Um, yeah. It's just a line. Uh, and I thought we were there, and now we're... No, we're not We're not arguing. We're just saying that because Mrs. Poulter had asked about other feedback from that day, and I was suggesting that we should review, and if it's material enough, we can include it. Okay, so... Okay, I, so we have a motion. I make a motion that we approve <coughs> the ESSER 3 uh, with the addition of the comments from October 12th board meeting regarding the rapid testing. I, have, I approve. Is there a second? Janelle. Janelle. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. All right, any further discussion? Um, the horse is never going to lift its head again. It is completely dead. <laughs> um, and it's, I think, the one I bet on at the uh, I think uh, so too. Boys and Girls Club uh, <laughs> fundraiser. Um, so we have a motion to approve the plan uh, as amended. Um, so back to the right spot. Can we vote? Yeah. I gotta ask a quick discussion. Uh, on number 10, why don't we just put rapid testing? On the line 10, page five, the top, yeah. it says COVID testing and nutrition, which I thought was a weird combination, but. Uh, but, um, but I'm just. When did that come up? That that's a list of the of the culmination of the October twelfth. I, I know, it, you know to, uh, to, but also that might have that must have come up during the thought exchange. 
Because it's a list on the top of page five of it? Oh yeah, number 10, nutrition uh -huh. and COVID-19 testing. I thought that was a weird combination of two things, but I bet you that COVID testing was related to the rapid test. Okay. Well, I think if this motion passes, the staff is directed to find a place to stick this in there, um, and uh, we will have accounted for the public's input and interest in uh, rapid testing. I like to use place. Yeah, it'll be place Sorry. there. <coughs> place, yes, <coughs> written in. Um, it will be done very quickly. <laughs> Rapidly. <laughs> Let's vote. Finish voting. <laughs> I already voted. Did you call for the vote? <coughs> okay, well, that was easy. Um, the motion passes with five <laughs> yes votes. Okay. So, the next item. Uh, do we need a presentation or is the board prepared to act? I'm prepared to act. I make a move that we approve. <laughs> I, I second. Okay. 15 points. She has a comment. Yeah, that's okay. Ms. Castillo it's has the board's something to meeting say. Here. Let's, uh, We're making your life easier. Okay. Okay. We okay, have a motion okay. to uh, approve the uh, salary increase for uh, Beaumont administrators, confidential, and management employees, um, effective uh, July 1st, 2021, and an increase of 1% of salary to the benefit allowance to the, the BACME benefits pool, effective July 1st, 2022. We have a motion to approve. And a second? Yes, David Sanchez. All right. Any discussion? other than Mrs. Castillo. <laughs> not because you're not helpful, but because we may just be able to move through this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, vote. Okay, congratulations. You are, this is a modest uh, demonstration of our respect and appreciation uh, for the work that you do. Um, and uh, we thank you and hope that this will uh, be a modest uh, benefit to you and uh, recognize it as uh, uh, we're, we're pleased to be able to do that and to be able to have uh, uh, a confidence in our budget uh, on an ongoing basis. So um, the board thanks you for your service. Thank you. Next item. Yeah, if you can sell this to <laughs> Mr. Mitchell, you're good. <laughs> Pursuant to government code section 54953, the district is required to make the following disclosure regarding the employment agreement for the superintendent and the assistant superintendents of business services, human resources, and instruction and support services, items 15.2 through 15.5. These actions will amend, amend the salary schedule for the superintendent and super assistant superintendents to reflect a 4% salary increase effective July 1, 2021. Additionally, these actions will increase the health and welfare cap by 1% during the current year and an additional 1% during the 22-23 school year. These increases reflect the same increases that were agreed upon between the district and the Beaumont Teachers Association. All other provisions of the employment agreements as previously amend amended will remain unchanged. Do we need to take each of these separately? Yes. Um, okay. Do we have a motion? No. You can take them together as long as you report out. I move that we approve 15.2, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, 15.3, Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, 15.4, Assistant Superintendent of Instruction and Support, and 15.5, uh, Superintendent of School Employee and all of their contracts. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion to approve uh, those increases. Does, uh, does so roll call okay. okay, and um, so the okay. motion is to approve uh, those increases as stated. Um, Mrs. Mara? Aye. I vote aye. 
Mr. Mitchell? <laughs> Aye. Mr. Sanchez? Aye. Mrs. Folker? Aye. Congratulations to the cabinet members uh, with the overwhelming support of the board uh, for uh, the work that you do and the, uh, the compensation that you uh, justly deserve. And I do want to acknowledge the support from the board and thank you on behalf of all the management team. Uh, we do value all of our employee units and uh, we have reached the agreement with BTA and we're very close to reach an agreement with our CSCA group, um, very proud of our relationships with all employee units. Okay, so we have the important stuff handled, the human infrastructure. So about our facilities. Good evening, President Lara, Acting President Hovey, board members. <laughs> Acting badly, actually. Superintendent Kakish. <laughs> Cabinet <coughs> colleagues and guests, thank you for uh, letting me pre present on our projects tonight. So um, at Beaumont High School, work continues. These images show the collaboration areas on the second floor of the building. It's looking really, really good. And those, those murals are actually in there? They are actually in there. Those are awesome. Yeah, they, they are awesome, aren't they? That's amazing. <laughs> in this section, the first two images to the left show the larger of the two meeting rooms in that collaboration area. The first picture is before the mural. The second picture is after the mural. It makes quite a difference in the look of that room. And then the last image is the smaller conference room that's in that collaboration area. This image shows the graphics that were installed in the computer tech classroom on the first floor um, in the CTE lab. The softball fields have been completed. The site has decided to authorize access to the students when they return after their winter break in order to give the turf enough time to be fully established. Um, and as you can see in the background of these images, the tennis court uh, wind block covering has been added um, and fully installed. And the students are using both the basketball courts and the um, tennis courts at the site already. Um, and, uh, just in, and so you may not know, but the student flow and moving from you know, the locker rooms and all of that, that's all working out well. That's working out great. One of the concerns that site staff had when we first finished that project is that there is a grassy hill right next to the tennis courts and they were afraid the students were going to be climbing down that hill as they went to the basketball courts and we haven't seen that at all. They're usually in the sidewalks and walking around that grassy area so it's staying beautiful. Thank you. Um, <coughs> and I, I, that uh, covered dugout, is that for softball? Those are, that is actually the softball fields. The yeah, baseball fields will be at the end of the project on the other side of the field. So yeah, um, this is the softball practice yeah, well, field. Well, that's a nice improvement over what yeah, they had before. <laughs> yes, it sure. is. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, we did ask the team at Palm Innovation Academy to be our test site for designed window coverings in lieu of window blinds. So this is the first classroom that received the window covering. Um, staff is still reviewing the functionality of this product and we'll move forward with additional classrooms at Palm if this works out. But it looks really great and it's a nice visual from the street. Is, 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 that, off, is that off of Palm? I mean, that It's not Palm? facing Palm yet. This is the one that actually faces the parking lot. We thought that was the best classroom to start with. Oh uh, yeah, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then at Starlight, the PTA donated some funds to assist with the addition of swings to their school site. So this is the finished product of the swings and the two uh, play toys that are pictured up here on the image to the left, those were actually moved to the other side of the site uh, where the other play toys were. Um, wanted to give you just a little bit of update on the Sunny Cal development. So in 2014, this was owned by CV Communities and it was approved and is still approved tentative tract map um, although the plans sh allowed them for over 500 homes, 
That original plan had 497 homes in the approved tract maps. That would generate about one and a half million in facility fees and <coughs> estimated to generate about 240 students from that development. On the right side we see today, and that is the Beaumont Summit Station. And that they're requesting project plan approval and moving towards CEQA for that plan that would change those homes to a re uh, commercial development. The area planning area 1A is e-commerce and from what I was reading, that is about two and a half million square feet of office space. Um, area two is a commercial space that would include hotel and restaurants with about 150,000 square feet. And area three is an open space, pretty much same as the other project. Um, these projects, if they were approved, would uh, generate about 1.8 million in school facility fees. Um, and based on our most recent student school fee justification study, where we uh, look at um, what we can anticipate for students from commercial projects. Um, this project looks to have about 9,000 employees in it, and uh, we can anticipate about um, 200 students on an inter-district transfer from those 9,000 employees. So it really isn't a huge difference in the impact to the district. I see that at the top it says Cherry, Cherry know, Valley Boulevard. What's the or the uh, vertical? What's it's where the um, sorry the the chicken ranch was right on Cherry Valley Boulevard. I don't know what the cross streets are, but okay. that mm -hmm. area is, that is all the way between um, Cherry Valley and Brookside Avenue. And then it's uh, on the left as you're going down Cherry Valley, going towards the freeway. Because it's in that that um, bottom left corner, the 10 freeway. Some Cali Grand used to be up above, or even uh, or right there. Right there. I don't think that, no, because no, that this is, um, potentially, the yes. Freeway would be over there. Yes. Yeah. Because well, it does curve across and you go. Mm -hmm. Because Sunny Cal used to be up on, the Egg Ranch used to be owned by the Ely's and it was up on, um, uh, not well, Orchard. Yeah, but that was a different portion of it. Mm -hmm. But the actual Sunny Cal was, it was up by, um, it was up off of Nancy, at the end of Nancy, mm -hmm. where it, Nancy ends and there's that new development. Because the Ely's owned it for years and years and years. So, but and I'm only going, calling that the Sunny Cal development is the information that I found from the city. They had another one and then they turned it into a mushroom farm down there. Oh, interesting. It, and I think portion of it is still a mushroom farm down there. So that's that Cherry Valley Boulevard. This is south of Cherry Valley Boulevard. Yes. Yes. And that that could be either Nancy or who knows. We're on the on the pink side. Well, there are some buildings on. I guess. Uh, on, on the on, on the, the aerial the, image the up here. E, the east side of it. Yeah, he's. By, by where the legend is, I don't know if that helps any. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess at, at that time you can narrow this down for us. Just I, I so can definitely can narrow that down and give you some aerial images yeah, of exactly where this is located. And then, we, I'm sorry, can you go back? Have yes. we received any funding uh, regarding this development, initial funding? No, we have not none received. None of that 1.5 million you referenced. We have not received any requests for uh, d to pay developer fees on this at all. They haven't moved forward with any of the homes in that project yet. Yeah. They're still under CEQA. You said they're still doing CEQA. So the the, 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 the one on the left is a currently approved right. tract map of homes. Right. So the, the development was sold and the company that bought this development does not want to build the residence, the residential homes. <laughs> they want to change this project to the commercial development that we see on the right gotcha. side of the screen. Okay. So we're, the impact on our schools, we're, uh, I know boundaries will change over time, uh, but currently this is in the Brookside or in? Uh, I the, the did side. not look at that. So when I come back with an aerial image of where that is located at, I will um, identify which school boundary that is in also. But and if they are successful in changing it to commercial, it probably won't generate students. Right. Well, well, that's so what I was going to ask next, because you made a statement that 
interdistrict right, transfers, 200 point. students. If we have, if they generate 9,000 employees, it could generate 200 students. Yeah, about mm -hmm. yes, about 200 students. Where, where, how does that? How do we arrive so at that? Be, based on what our current demographics are and our current student population and how they come to the district through interdistrict transfers, they take all that into consideration for the last five years and extrapolate that information. So they estimate that. 0.1% of the employees will request to bring their students in. So based on the total number of, and, and then they estimate how many employees would be in based on the type of building um, and, uh, you know, like a, a hotel might have less employees than an office space will and a manufacturing plant would have more employees than let's say office space. So they give you the breakdown of how many employees you can expect from a different type of development and then you apply that multiplier to the total number of employees to determine how many may come in on an interdistrict transfer. Is, is huh. e-commerce a euphemism for logistics? No, what I was reading in the report, e-commerce is, they're calling it office space, not a, a logistics center. Mm. I'm wondering if they're wanting to switch over because who wants to live by all of that construction being built across the street? Uh, that is potentially, or maybe they're just seeing that area more as an as a industrial corridor than a residential area because of the... Um, the logistic buildings going in across the street. How sad is that? It was such great land. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they brought in the that huge megastructure, and yes. no one, yeah. no one wants to live out there. And this is different um, from on the other side of Cherry Valley Boulevard, which is on in the county. This is in the city, correct? This is within yeah. the city limits of Beaumont. Yeah. Yes. So s the city would have to agree to this change. Yes, and a lot of my information that I have on the office space and the, the new ownership and stuff came from a conversation with city staff. Thank you. Thank you. But this is north of Brookside. This yes, is. it's in between Brookside and Cherry Valley, so it c encompasses that whole area from Brookside all the way up to Cherry Valley. So at some point after Nancy, it turns back to Beaumont property? As opposed to county? As opposed to... The county or Cherry Valley? I, I would have to verify that. I know that Beaumont is reporting on this project on their website, the city is. So, because um, if it's Beaumont land, it would have to change. There has to be a cutout because. Yeah, I can report exactly what the city limits are when I bring that, that back. I always to thought the, Brookside yeah. was the uh, divider. I, I always thought so too, but when I started researching this, I got most of my information from the city too. Oh, interesting. And then um, just wanted to take a minute and talk a little bit about Calamasa's Oak Valley Town Center. Really appreciate the name since we have an Oak Valley here in, in Beaumont. But I wanted to just kind of help you guys understand where this project is. So um, on the bottom of the map to the right, you'll see that blue area that says Junior High School. That's <coughs> actually where our Summer Wind Trails Elementary School is. And we're anticipating the commercial development across the street from the school. Um, that'll be commercial retail <coughs> property. And the town center is just above that development. Um, the business park uh, surrounding that, we don't have any information on. Um, but this future development will actually add full freeway access at Singleton Road. Um, the three areas are the Beaumont schools. So we have summer wind trails down at the bottom of the map that's already built and then the two other sites that have been set aside for future school sites within the summer wind trails phase two and three. Um, the, um, as you can see, the project's on the east side of Roberts Road, and the promoters of this center are looking for large anchor stores, small box stores, restaurants, drive throughs entertainment, and hospitality. And that concludes tonight's presentation. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next agenda item is uh, uh, notices of completion for several projects. Um, Ms. Harbauer, anything? Uh, do you have anything to share with us on this, or do you, you just? 
been waiting for a month. For yeah. the no, these are Which stand is that? Apologize, I didn't turn on the microphone. There, there is no presentation tonight. These are a few of the uh, subcontractors on the project that we are presenting to you for approval for a notice of completion. Okay. For their, uh, I'll move approval. Second. Oh, yeah. Okay. Any discussion about uh, these notices? <coughs> we'll proceed to the vote. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. And so we move on to our um, report. So it, DSEA, do you have a report, DSEA? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, President Laura, members of the board, Superintendent Kakish, colleagues, and community members. There is no doubt we are living in unprecedented times. Living and working through the initial outbreak of COVID-19 throughout 2020 was challenging. Many Americans lost their jobs, their businesses, and many of them lost their loved ones. Through all that loss, time kept moving on, and so did Americans. 2021 came around and brought on new challenges, such as figuring out how to bring our students back to school for hybrid learning, during the end of our last school year and the reopening of our schools in full in-person learning this school year. Both, tax, both tasks were executed while trying to keep our students and staff safe during a pandemic. Most recently, 2021 has brought on another challenge, the test or vaccine requirements mandated by our state's governor. There has been a lot of classified employees reaching out to CSEA asking us to side with them and fight the governor's mandate and to fight for their rights. They want CSEA to push back against the district and ask that Beaumont Unified School District not implement the mandate. During any other circumstances, when this many members reach out to CSEA, we move in that direction. CSEA as an organization will not be following through with the member's request. CSEA is here to ensure that classified have a safe and healthy workplace good and affordable health care, good pay, and a retirement that they can depend on. CSEA does not protect its members from the state. That being said, CSEA would like the members of the board to know that the majority of classified employees at BUSD do not agree with the governor's mandate. They want you to know that they would like to work for a school district that would protect, would protect their rights as Americans and push back against the mandate. Most of, their con most of their statements are do not take away our rights. One other challenge 2021 has brought is a shortage of workers. We started the school year with many vacancies and three months later we still have many vacancies. Although we know that the shortage of workers is district wide, we've had a difficult time hiring and retaining employees in comparison to other school districts. The majority of our classified feel this is due to Beaumont School District's low paying salary schedule and its inability to show classified that they're valued as employees. This has been proven for years now, especially during the pandemic, when other school districts took care of their classified by only calling back needed employees during 2020. Beaumont School District required all classified to come back to work. When other school districts offered hazard pay, also known as COVID pay, during 2020, BUSD did not. It has been a long time since classified employees felt valued working here. Why are we not flying our vacant positions sooner? Why are we contracting out positions and not hiring within? Are we not paying enough? That is a huge concern. Our positions that we know we're gonna be flying once a vacant one has been filled are not being flown soon enough. <clears throat> Why are we, including myself, being forced to work in an understaffed environment? How is that fair or right? You voted in an increase for admin tonight. It has been over three years since the same for classified. 
our current staff is overworked and completely underpaid which is why we have so many vacancies why can we never think ahead of these effects the problem is never going to get smaller help us is a classified request recently in the last six months csea has noticed a change the communication has improved between csea and the district the negotiation team has been able to get more work done in the past six months than we have in the past four years. Still, classified employees need to be able to see and feel the results of these changes. The best way to accomplish this is by the district throwing money at its biggest problem. Throwing money at classified salary schedule. Classified salary schedule has been extremely low in comparison to other school districts in size and the entire classified unit knows it. Certificated knows it and many admin know it. The district and CSEA have been working on negotiating classified salary schedule and our contract. We have made great progress in a short period of time. However, there is much more work to be done. CSEA is asking for the school board's support in all that district and CSEA need to accomplish. We are also asking that the school board help the district and show all classified employees that they matter. We put ourselves at risk every single day we are on site, understaffed. What are you as a district and human beings doing for us? We ask that the school board and district show all classified employees what their value and worth is working for Beaumont Unified School District. We have made some progress. However, the wick on the candle is thin. We ask you to help us want to stay. Thank you. Okay, I understand we do not have a DCA report uh, tonight. Um, uh, does uh, Zach may have a report. Mm -hmm. Wow, Nancy Sinatra. Boots of Amber Wash. Yes, I'm wearing cowboy boots. Because <laughs> it's Red Ribbon Week and we are celebrating every day. So you will see us dressed up. Just put it out there because everybody's staring at me. Uh, good evening, Board President Lara, Board Members, Superintendent Kakish, Cabinet, and Community. Um, I invite you all to join us for Red Ribbon Week activities on site. You can come all week long. We'll be doing them at all sites. Um, on behalf of the BACME team, we'd like to thank the Board of Trustees for their support in approving the increase to the Beaumont Administrator's Confidential Management Employee Salary Schedules. Um, it's been a challenging year, as we already know, and our team has been working hard to continue to provide consistency of operations. Um, at the ESF and at our school sites for our students and families. We want to continue to thank everybody who's coming out from all over the district to help us, especially on sites with um, challenges that we have. Uh, we'd like to congratulate uh, Serenity Jung on her appointment at the last board meeting as our new Director of Risk and Safety Management. Uh, we welcome her to Beaumont and our team. Uh, we want to congratulate Steve Koch tonight uh, for joining our admin team, and Anna Haas will be excited for more support there. And a big shout out to our very own Dr. Blasey. Uh, she's receiving the Transformational Change Award by Cal State San Bernardino, and she received the recognition earlier this month, and she's very deserving of that award, and we couldn't be happier for her. So congratulations. <laughs> All right, and that is my report. Any Thank questions? You. Do you want any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so is that your comment, Mr. Sanchez, because it's your turn? Oh, bless you, sir. Um, Beaumont has 44 jobs currently posted on EdJoin, and I know there's some concerns, but if you go to EdJoin and you start looking it up by the county, Riverside County alone has 2,570 jobs being posted. San Bernardino County has 2,309, 90 jobs posted. It's, it's not localized. Next, we heard people complaining about our classroom and facilities and as a board member we have policy and that policy needs to be followed I'm not, doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on 
and that's Administrative Regulation 1312.4. And our own Arnold Schwarzenegger negotiated that. It's called the Williams Uniform Complaint Process. That comes to the board for these concerns for our facilities. And this school board prides itself on its facilities. So the process needs to be followed. <coughs> so those that are listening, if it's true that our classrooms are filthy and our bathrooms are disgusting, as stated by a student, then there's a process that this board has approved to have that notices, those notices brought to us to be addressed. And I think I'm gonna conclude there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, no, that's inappropriate at this time. This is the board's opportunity to speak. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mitchell. Well, I'm baffled by the comments from CSEA right now because um, I think tonight we approved 11.3, which they uh, negotiated and um, approved themselves. Uh, which goes towards addressing some of the issues that were brought up, but it seemed like listening to the comments that we haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very happy that we approved 11.3 um, and we're starting to address issues that are statewide and um, national issues. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Harvey? Speak to myself in the third person. There you go. Okay. Um, <laughs> Mr. Vice President acting as president. <laughs> yes. Uh, um, this has been a long day. Um, it started out with uh, probably the best kind of day that we have uh, with the student of the month breakfast uh, at uh, Sizzler for uh, award winners from both Banning uh, High Schools and Beaumont High Schools. And um, also there this morning, uh, uh, Mr. Mitchell, Ms. Kakish, Ms. Zapata, Dr. Brown, um, Mr. Breyer. Um, so we had a good turnout, uh, all to celebrate um, our 21st Century Institute uh, Student of the Month, Abby Esquivel. Uh, Dr. Carr was there with her along with uh, uh, her teacher. Uh, her nominating teacher, and from Beaumont High School, Sadie Struna um, was uh, the student of the month, uh, also joined by uh, Dr. Jimenez and uh, her nominating teacher. Um, it's always inspiring to hear the stories of these students. Um, I thought, you know, I particularly noticed that two of the students of the four made reference to the depression uh, they experienced during COVID and remote learning um, and how it impacted them. And that was important to me because I've read a lot about it. I've read it in you know, AXA and CSBA and other literature, but to hear two of our own students talking about it and how it impacted them was uh, profound. Um, but I'm so proud of those students for uh, what they've done to, uh, to learn from the experience it was a very, it was adult kind of behavior for them to turn from, you know, why did this happen to me to uh, why did this happen for me and I've turned this into a positive event and here's what I've learned about myself. So it was so exciting to see students and their growth and to know that each one of those students referenced back to at least one teacher or a counselor or a principal uh, as being the one that helped them I get over that hurdle. So, um, you know, two students out of 11,217, something like that, uh, but they represent uh, the successes that we have uh, with our students, and it's because of all of the people behind them and their families that help them. On a more mundane uh, comment, uh, we have a Mountain View school in middle schools uh, give me an award program to go to the Fox Cineplex. That's great, um, but I just wonder, 
you know, I would hope that we look to doing business with Riverside, or with Beaumont businesses uh, before we go outside of the district to do, to do business. And we now have a theater complex uh, in Marketplace. Um, there may be reasons for going to the Fox, but I just ask us to make sure that we look at doing business uh, in our own community. With that, President Laura. Oh, Oh, you skipped me. Thanks. Don't skip Janelle. Don't skip Janelle. Well, I couldn't skip Janelle because <laughs> um, she was my partner at the uh, fundraiser Saturday night uh, for the Boys and Girls Club. Yes, we yeah. went to the Boys and Girls Club fundraiser, which was a lovely event. It was really cold, but we had a great time at their Hatters and Horses, or Horses and Hatters, which... Um, I saw Mr. Hovey, and he neither had a horse nor a hat. But all in all, it was a great time, and it was it was nice to see something that supported a program that a lot of our kids use. So I was happy to be there. Um, I also wanted to um, <coughs> also talk about. I know we have a lot of parents um, and students that are coming and voicing their opinions and concerns, and um, and want to be heard. Um, and, and I was thinking about this, that we did offer at a time where we had our elected officials come here to talk about different issues, and maybe this would be a good time for um, Be Beaumont to invite Chad Mays, to invite our, our people to hear the concerns of our, of our, our, our parents and our students, oh, yeah. because th that's, that's the location that that really has an impact of what is coming in July or August of next year, um, and, th and it's impacting them. Um, and it could be for both sides of, of, of what people feel and what they wanna say about the mandates. Um, and that's what I'd like to like maybe see you, that we can encourage. And with that, I will say um, good night. Oh yeah, Rosalie Sotoa Bogue, yeah. I mean, I just meant, um, I just okay. mean that, you okay. know, our elected officials, I mean, all of them. I, I was just thinking of Chad Mays because I know he has come, so it's not, a, it's not out of his realm. But I, I would agree that Rosalie's Bogue, Ochoa Bogue would also, yeah, all of them, all of our elected yeah, officials. Yeah, those are our, our local mm -hmm. senator and, and assembly member persons. Now, Mrs. Lara, oh, President you. Lara. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, um, I just wanna start by saying I have taken two school tours with Mrs. Kakish. We've gone to Starlight and to Brookside. And um, you know, as we sit in here and we do our school board stuff and we talk about our students and I think we're getting, we're getting focused, our focus is getting, there's distraction from COVID so when we go to the school sites and see the kids actually in classrooms, learning, doing all those things that they do, it, it was just, it's been really good to go and visit the school sites. And um, we have another visit coming up pretty soon. We're trying to go to all the schools. So um, that's been really good to see the kids just, you know, doing, doing what they do. And the teachers working hard and the um, classified staff working hard, everybody is doing what they need to be doing. And it's good to see. Um, thank you, Steve, for running the meeting tonight. I appreciate that. So, because yes, I did have COVID and um, I'm on the other side of it. I'm so happy to be on the other side of it. It's good. Um, I'm a little torn about what I, what I want to say, but um, it makes me sad to hear that CSEA doesn't feel valued when we're still in negotiations and we haven't come to a resolution yet. So it's not fair to say that we don't care and um, we are taking steps to make things right. We are flying positions and um, we are trying to hire people and the only way we can get help is to do some contract work. And I'm sorry that you guys don't understand that, but if you can't see what's going on in the nation, I don't know what to tell you. So um, we are trying to do what's best for the students and the staff in the district. This COVID 
stuff and, and everything happening in our nation right now is out of our control. It is not something that any of us up here signed up for. I never said as a school board member, oh, please give me a pandemic so I can, I can try and manage that. That's not something I ever wanted to do. And it's been very difficult. And so we are doing the best that we can. And, and I just, I wanted to, I'm not quite sure it's coming across right, but it's frustrating because this has been a very, very trying time for everyone, and I've said this before. So just because we're the school board doesn't mean that we don't struggle with decisions and things. We take a lot of time and we do a lot of discussion and you know, I even, I am so tired of talking about COVID with my family and friends and you know, I don't know what to do and you know, it's, it's complicated and it's frustrating and I'm sick to death of it. And I'm sure that everybody here is sick to death of it because it's just, it's so much and it's overwhelming. So, um, you know, things are changing at a rapid pace in the country. Um, people aren't working. There's a lot of jobs available, but the pay is just all over the place, all over the nation. It's not just schools, it's everywhere. So if, if that can be fixed, that would be awesome. So, I mean, I, I just don't know how we're gonna get people to apply for jobs. We can't make people apply for a job and we're not just gonna hire someone off the street that's not qualified. So, yeah, I'm, I sound a little mad because I am. So, um, I guess I probably shouldn't say anymore. So, with that, I guess we should adjourn our meeting at 8.59.